Hey guys, so I have been spending some time with a sock knitting machine and I wanted to share a bit of my progress and what I'm learning to do right now. I'm gonna show you the socks that I've made so far and also what I've learned about the river. Hey there, thank you so much for being here. I'm Felicia from Sweet Georgia and we come here every week to talk about something to do with the fiber arts. And my goal here with our Taking Back Friday videos is to encourage you to make time for your own making. I have been carving out some evening time to practice using the circular sock knitting machine. And so today I wanted to share with you my mountain of practice swatches and also now my ribbing swatches. So the last time that we had talked about the circular sock knitting machine, I had just received the machine from Earl Locker and I just got it set up and I was learning to crank, basically crank tubes on it and I was learning to make heels on it and basically I was just making a lot of gauge swatches with the Tough Love sock, trying to figure out what gauge I could knit on the 60 stitch cylinder with and without the heel spring on. But since then, I've been practicing a lot of the skills and I managed to actually knit a bunch of heels and toes that were not incorrect. And so I thought, I know how to do heels and toes now. I can knit some socks. So I managed to actually knit a few little short socks. <laughs> so I'm actually going camping for a few weeks in August and so I wanted to crank just a pile of these kinds of socks so that I could take them with me and then my plan is to sit there and kind of kitchener the toes while I'm at camping. Who knows if I'll finish. These are called heel tab no show socks and I got the pattern from Jamie Mayfield's website CSM Supplies and it's a free pattern you can download from her website. So basically you can knit these on a circular sock machine with just two skills. You need to be able to hang a hem and then you need to basically be able to work short rows and the short rows happen in three different spots. So you first work a short section of short rows which becomes the heel tab. Then you kind of fold it over and then hang the hem. So hanging the hem is really just about taking the live stitches that are knit onto the waist yarn and then hanging each of those live stitches on each needle. And so this basically knits the live stitches down into your fabric and it creates a nice folded edge with nothing to sew in except for this one end. Okay, so that the inside looks nice and smooth. So you've made your short row tab, you've hung the hem, and then you work the heel. You work a short row for the heel, then you crank all your foot rounds, and then you work your short row toe, and that's it. And so in this case, I basically switched from the sock yarn back to the waist yarn, cranked a little bit of waist yarn so that I have a separator, and then I can continue on and make the next sock. So theoretically, I could just keep adding on socks and make like a whole string of socks and then just separate them all later. So I was feeling pretty good about my short row heels and toes. And so I started to look at some other ways of making heels. So when I learned to knit socks by hand, I learned to knit a heel flap and then pick up along the sides of the flap. And there's actually a method of cranking a square heel flap on the CSM that I tried and it works perfectly. So someone in the comments recommended these books from Lucy Best. So she has two books. One's called Essentials of Circular Machine Knitting. And then the second one is called Circular Machine Knitting Beyond Basics. This one is more about the river and these different heel flaps. This one is more about like gauge and tension and setting up the machine and everything like that. So I basically followed step by step the instructions in this book in order to knit that square heel flap. So hopefully you can kind of see the heel flap situation here. I'm gonna have to take some photos for you. So knitting this heel flap requires you to do some crazy things like you take the needles out of the cylinder and then you hang them inside the cylinder, just letting them rest while the needles are still holding the stitches. And it feels kind of crazy, but it actually works. So it does take more time to do this square heel I found, but I like it and I feel like it could be worth the effort. So I would have to knit a full pair of socks with each different kind of heel and test to to see which one feels better. So there was a couple more things that I wanted to try with the CSM and one of them was switching the cylinders from the 60 stitch cylinder to the 72 stitch cylinder. And I have a feeling that the 72 cylinder could pr actually produce 
even finer gauge stitches because all of the needles are closer together. But before I go and take apart the machine and start changing out the cylinders, I thought that I would start working on the river and figure that out. So this is the river. You can see this is the river arm. This is the river dial. This thing is called the tappet plate. This thing, it actually turns around. So a couple of things tripped me up about the river. I spent probably an hour at midnight on the weekend trying to figure out why the river was not working for me. And so here is what I learned. So this is the river and the arm. I think it's pretty obvious that the river fits in right here. There's like a big tube and a small tube and they fit into the big hole and the small hole. It just works, it fits here. What I didn't realize is that you can't just pop the river on. You need to make sure that the fin, which is this thing on the bottom of the river, is right up against the pin that's on the inside of the cylinder. So they say the fin to the pin. When you put this river in, the fin, should be sitting up right next to the pin so that it doesn't move. It doesn't move anymore. So it's basically going to stay in this place. So this keeps the river dial in place and prevents the river needles from moving around and crashing into the cylinder needles. Okay, the second thing I realized is that I did not put in the drive pin. So it's this L-shaped thing. This drive pin needs to go in here. I forgot this in the shipping box. I didn't realize that I needed to use it. So the drive pin needs to be right next to the timing screw in order to ensure that the tappet plate pushes the ribbing needles out at the right time. If the ribbing needles pop out at the wrong time, they won't be in sequence with the cylinder needles. And so they might also crash into the river arm, which might cause those ribbing needles to break. So looking at the river, one aspect of this is to make sure that the ribbing needles are in the right place. And then the second part of this is to make sure that the ribbing needles are popping out at the right time. So in order to knit one by one ribbing, you need the stitches to knit sequentially, like cylinder needle, ribbing needle, cylinder needle, ribbing needle. Okay, so you have to put the river into the machine in the right place where the fin touches the pin, then have your drive pin in here, and that is going to be next to the screw. So that means this, this drive pin is what basically couples the tappet to the, where this yarn carrier area. So when the stitches from the cylinder are popping up, that's also when the ribbing needles will pop out. And so they have to alternate, alternate cylinder needle, ribbing needle, cylinder needle, ribbing needle, so on and so forth. So finally, I made another mistake. I tried to put in all of the ribbing needles first before setting the river up on the machine. I realized later that I need to first remove every other cylinder needle, then put the river on, then put the river needles into every other slot so that they are offset from the cylinder needles. So if you put the ribbing needles and the cylinder needles in the same corresponding slot, the ribbing needle and the cylinder needle will crash into each other and break. So you need to make sure that they are offset, the slots are offset. I also learned that you can only put in so many ribbing needles at a time and then you need to crank, sort of advance the crank in order to open up another area where then you can put in the rest of the ribbing needles. So <laughs> this is my first ribbing sample. I was so excited about this. This is one by one ribbing. Ta -da! You can see this is my waste yarn up here and then I basically uh, managed to crank one by one ribbing onto the waist yarn. And then I was so excited, I just switched to the Tough Love sock yarn and then started to crank a bunch of ribbing. <laughs> and I'm so excited, like this is so beautiful. Ta-da! It's one by one ribbing. Yeah, so I cranked a bunch of this ribbing. I think it's beautiful. I think that this is going to allow me to knit socks for the kids on the 60 stitch cylinder. So if I removed the waist yarn, I would just have live stitches that I would need to deal with right now. And so I had to look 
for a way of doing a cast on that would not produce sort of this effect. And so I tried to learn Juana's selvage, which is a technique for creating a selvage with a one by one ribbing. I had to hunt down a couple of videos to watch this technique in action. Um, and I definitely, I messed up the first time. So I think that this is not really detachable. This is, again, my, my one by one ribbing with the waist yarn still connected to it. But I think if I take out the waist yarn, it, it might not stay in place. In any case, <laughs> with this particular sample, I knit the one by one ribbing and then I learned how to switch back to stockinette. So I had to practice everything step by step, but you can see this is my sample. It's actually the sample that worked. And in order to make this one by one ribbing with this nice selvage on top here, I'll show you. It's a nice finished selvage. So you have to basically put the ribbing needles in individually, one at a time, picking up the strand of yarn that is between two cylinder needles. And then you create a bit of a zigzag on the machine. So you're basically running the yarn from a cylinder needle to a ribbing needle, to a cylinder needle, to a ribbing needle. So I managed to knit this selvage and add back all of the cylinder needles to the empty slots then transfer all of the ribbing needles to the cylinder needles in order to continue cranking all of this in stockinette. Woohoo! <laughs> I feel like my mind is blown. I don't know why I think that this is the most amazing thing. One by one ribbing and stockinette are the most basic and the most fundamental knitting techniques in hand knitting. And I just, I take it all for granted. And so I feel like learning to use the CSM after all these years of hand knitting. It's like learning to walk again, like one by one ribbing and stockinette. It's so cool. <laughs> so my next challenge is to knit a ribbed sock for Nina. Now we have been saving this neon pink yarn for years. I dyed it with the neon acid dyes many, many years ago for the School of Sweet Georgia because one of the members had asked a question about, oh, is it difficult to exhaust neon dyes? And I was like, I don't know, let's find out. So I dyed a skein as a test. And so Nina has been wanting socks in this color for a while now. So I am finally going to try it. I've traced the footprints of each of my kids and I've taken the measurements so that I could calculate how many foot rows to crank. And then I also found some rough notes on the steps to knit a ribbed sock. So here is the plan. I'm going to set up for one by one ribbing using Juana's selvage. You crank that out for the cuff. You can do like 20 rows or however many rows. If you want, you could do this in a different color. And then I could theoretically switch to a three by one ribbing for the leg, or I can just keep going with the one by one ribbing for the leg. Then when I get close to the heel, what I'm gonna do is I need to replace half of the stitches that are gonna eventually be the heel stitches. I have to replace those with all cylinder stitches. So I go back to stockinette on that side. Then I would knit a couple of rounds of pre-heel where the top of the foot continues to go in ribbing. And then the bottom of the foot will be in stockinette. And then I will knit the short row heel, just basically working back and forth on the stockinette side or on the bottom of the foot. Then I go ahead and I crank all the way around for the foot um, where the top is going to be ribbing, bottom is gonna be stockinette. And then I work the short row toe and that is it. <laughs> so I think this is gonna work. Wish me luck. So that is basically it for today. Thank you so much for being here to listen to me talk about sock knitting and heels and heel flaps and one by one ribbing. I am so excited. If you like this video, please do hit the like button. And if you would like to see more content about the fiber arts, please do hit subscribe. We come here every week to talk about something to do with either knitting or spinning or weaving or dyeing. Thank you guys so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. All right, bye for now. Hello everyone and welcome back to a, a wonderful sock knitting video. First, crank your sock knit. Time to add the pink yarn. You don't have to use pink, you can use whatever color you want.